Our modern lesson today is quite familiar to many of us. It's written by Reinhold Niebuhr. And I always want to point out that Reinhold Niebuhr was ordained in, <clears throat> excuse me, in our denomination. Well, not precisely the United Church of Christ, but in the German Evangelical Synod of North America, which is one of the denominations that became the United Church of Christ. This excerpt is from a sermon that he wrote from which the serenity prayer has evolved. This is a direct quote. I don't love his use of gender exclusive language, but I've left it as it is. I don't resonate with some of his theology that comes through in this quote. However, you know, whether we are spiritual or not, <clears throat> We don't have to agree completely to recognize each other's gifts. We would all do well, in my opinion, to live by the spirit of this quote by Reinhold Niebuhr. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can and wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardships as the pathway to peace, taking as he did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, <clears throat> trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will, that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever in the next. Amen. Last week we began our worship series on spiritual resiliency. How might we develop the ability to live from a place of deep centeredness and calm that is not dependent on circumstance? This morning I'm having a good opportunity to practice that. <laughs> this extended period of disruption to our normal routines is unprecedented. Yes, it is filled with uncertainty. It's proving to be extremely challenging for many of us. Spiritual leaders such as Michael Singer, whom we talked about last week, remind us though that this moment is essentially no different from any other moment. He says we live in two worlds, the inside world and the outside world. It's always like that. A person has no control over the outside world. It unfolds as it will in ways that are welcomed at times and unwelcomed at times. The inside world, the interior world, is a different story. A person has the ability to control the inside world, the center of consciousness, clarity, and power. Even if the outside world is scary, it doesn't have to come into the interior self, to the inside world. So over the next week, we'll keep talking about how a person can develop a sort of spiritual resiliency that will allow them to take charge of their inside world, even when the outside world is very difficult. And I've come to the conclusion that this time of shutdown is the perfect moment to do that sort of interior work. We're all in the same position of needing to be quarantined and in our homes as much as possible. On the outside, things are scary in ways that are particular to each one of us, depending on our circumstances. The question is, will we fight this moment kicking and screaming? Or will we use it? Will we use this time to help us grow and learn more about ourselves? This could be the moment of practice that can carry us through the rest of our lives. Wisdom is available to us from so many sources, and it's never been more accessible. The Christian tradition offers tried and true ancient practices and texts, as do all religious traditions. There are contemporary spiritual teachers online every day. On YouTube, you can find sermons and talks and courses from almost anyone you admire. 
And if you don't know who to look for, there are countless organizations that will send you devotion a day or devotion a week that cull through and find the very best, most helpful information. Today, I'm going to share from recovery addiction resources. Some of my family members have struggled with drug and alcohol addiction over the years. And I've seen firsthand, as have many of you, how helpful some of the strategies and ways of thinking are that come from the field of addiction recovery. I recently came across an article, it's put out by Virginia Commonwealth University, by a campus organization that supports students with substance abuse issues. And it just reminded me that people in recovery from addiction know stuff. They know stuff that can help them endure very difficult times with strength and dignity. And many of those practices are enormously helpful right now for anyone who might be struggling during this time of disruption. I'm gonna quickly go through 10 points that originate in recovery addiction wisdom and then apply them to our current reality of living through a pandemic. It may seem strange to begin here, but number one is give up. The fight is fixed, things cannot be changed. That's a central tenet of recovery. People in recovery must accept that they cannot control their substance use once they start using. This allows them to move forward with a goal of not using at all. In the same way, we have to accept the reality of COVID before we can navigate it. We're quarantined, we're anxious about loved ones or about ourselves, maybe we've lost a job, maybe we're concerned about the continued economic fallout. To accept this reality is not to be defeated by it. Acceptance helps us to move forward and do things that we need to do. Reach out to friends or file for unemployment. Challenge those in power to do better. Number two, halt. If you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. Have you ever been hangry? You know, that experience where you're hungry and you just cannot function well until you eat something? It's not pretty. You're sort of out of control of yourself. Whether you're in recovery or enduring a pandemic, it's imperative to pay attention to yourself and to how you're feeling. This kind of awareness can help us kind of keep it together so we can be there for our friends, our families, our communities. You can't pour from an empty cup. Take care of your own needs first. And in order to do that, you need to know what your own needs are first. Number three, progress, not perfection. People will stumble in recovery, particularly early on. Not everyone will relapse, some do. Not everyone relapses, but they'll have emotional outbursts or make poor decisions. Maybe they'll feel overwhelmed at times. To succeed in recovery, you have to keep trying anyway. It's a lot like that in isolation. Some days are tough. Some days are very tough. But it's never too late to do one small thing that can turn that hard day around, that can improve your well-being. Things like step outside, drink a glass of water, call a friend, get some exercise, draw a picture, do something creative. Living with this new normal, Living in general is a learning process for all of us. We need to lighten up on ourselves. Number four, peace amid the storm, not freedom from it. People in recovery learn to face life head on without substances to numb them, 
They learn to exist alongside difficult circumstance instead of running away from it. Life in a pandemic is challenging. Life will always be challenging. It's not about finding a life without challenge. The goal is resilience, the ability to rebound in the face of inevitable hardship. Number five, one day at a time. Early in recovery, people get caught up in wondering if they're gonna make it in sobriety or not. It's scary to think of never using again. And it's so easy now to get caught up in worrying about how long is this going to last? How bad will things get? Could this be the practice round for an even bigger one down the road? Instead of trying to predict what's going to lie ahead, focus on doing the next right thing, even if it seems small. Number six, service transforms pain. Service to others is one of the most important pillars of addiction recovery. Painful experiences can be transformed into meaningful ones if a person can bring newfound knowledge and energy back into helping other people who are struggling. The pain that we feel right now is an invitation to deepen our empathy. We benefit by reaching out to others who are struggling. It doesn't have to be in giant ways. It could have a giant impact even if it's a small thing. Call someone who might be having a hard time. Write a letter to someone you appreciate and haven't thought about in a long time. Write a letter to someone in prison I can connect you with someone if you would like to have a name. Think about what your life is like and what it would be like to be imprisoned right now. Every week in our online newsletter, there are ways that you can help right now. Number seven, gratitude. Remembering what we still have and the ways in which we're fortunate is a great buffer against hardship. People in recovery sometimes struggle to break free of the assumption that everything is awful. Listing things to be grateful for challenges that assumption and encourages perseverance. Want to get started with gratitude? It's easy. Just open your eyes. Look around the room in which you're sitting right now. I'm here with my friends Robert and Lauren. The morning has not gone as we wish, but we're here together, engaged in this ministry together. What about you? If you're alone, do you pretty much have what you need? People are food deprived now. You're probably not. And if you are, all you have to do is call me. This church can help. Are there people who love you? A pet who depends on you? Are you quarantined with someone who's actually pretty good company? Are your children receiving a good education? Just make a list of all the things that you're grateful for and then do it again tomorrow. Gratitude is a feel-good emotion that can supersede fear. Number eight, surviving and thriving. It's often said that people don't get into recovery to drop out of life, but to get back into life. We're certainly focused on surviving in this moment, yes, but we can also be laying the groundwork for a brighter future. We could focus on what we cannot do. In recovery, you can't use drugs or alcohol. In quarantine, we can't gather face to face. We can't hug. But think of 
all of the things we still can do. We can exercise, learn, connect virtually, read, do art. We can learn a completely new skill. We can survive. And what we do now can help us to thrive. Number nine, mutual aid, not self-help. There are many paths to recovery, but every one of them involves community. Addiction, like a pandemic, can lead to isolation and disconnection. In order to survive and grow, we need each other. And if you're listening now, congratulations, you found a community that you can connect with, even now. And number 10, normal is just a setting on the dryer. People in recovery have learned through sitting in meetings over many, many years that there is no such thing as normal. Even though folks can lose years of their lives trying for it, Human beings, we can be so critical of ourselves for not measuring up that we become blind to what is unique or beautiful or possible in ourselves or in a situation such as this. People in recovery often find that when they can acknowledge and embrace the parts of themselves they were once ashamed of, they are able to grow. And if we can acknowledge what we perceive as limitations to our situation right now, it can become a place to thrive. There's no single right way to do a pandemic. I mean, there are some wrong things that you can do, <laughs> make no mistake, but there are lots of ways to do it right. It's okay to be very anxious or to not be anxious at all. You can wear pajamas all day, Robert and Lauren are both wearing their pajamas right now. <laughs> you can eat pancakes for dinner. You can read or nap or do neither. You can stay up late, Zoom with friends to stay in touch, or not Zoom at all if you're exhausted by looking at screens all the time. Nothing about this time is normal. If you're keeping yourself and others safe, as safe as you can, and if you're continuing to work at any pace on your own well-being, then you're doing great. Mm -hmm. now, next week, we'll continue with our series on spiritual resiliency. We'll even welcome a very special guest. That's a little teaser. In the meantime, over the coming week, please know that your church is here for you. Your pastor loves you. If you're struggling, reach out. Friends, may God bless you and keep you. May the face of God shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may God give you peace. Amen.